you remember when there were just nine planets? Now it seems that hardly a week goes by without a new discovery being announced. This is all thanks to advances in technology, which has finally allowed us over the past 20 years to look beyond our own solar system, discovering nearly 2,000 of these distant worlds along the way. But this is just the start, because the race has begun to find the first planet outside our solar system with life on it, a second version of the Earth. It's been called the Holy Grail of Science, with the potential to answer that most ancient question of whether we are alone in the universe, to find a planet beyond our own solar system where life has also arisen. And we're a lot closer than you might think. In fact, just this last July, at a NASA press conference, astronomer Kevin Hand boldly proclaimed that within the next 20 years, we will find out that we're not alone in the universe. But how are we going to do this? And once we find the planet, how will we know that there's life on it? So the very first planets that were discovered, uh, the first one, 51 Pegasi b, back in 1995, were gas giants, absolutely huge planets orbiting extremely close to their stars, and we call them hot Jupiters. Because these planets are so heavy, the huge gravitational force they exert on their star causes it to wobble back and forth. And as it does that, the light that the star emits becomes redder and then bluer, depending on whether it's moving away from us or towards us, in just the same way as the pitch of an ambulance becomes higher as it moves towards you and then lower as it moves away from you. But the problem is that this effect is really small and difficult to measure for smaller planets that are much further away from their star, so it took 10 years after the first hot Jupiter was found, before the first rocky planet, Gliese 876d, was found in 2005. At a distance of 15 light years away from the Earth, this planet was unlike anything we saw in our own solar system. With a mass seven times that of the Earth, it was the first planet around a main sequence star in an entirely new class of object, now called the Super Earths. People started to wonder if it would be possible for life to exist on such worlds, but unfortunately in the case of Gliese 876d, it orbits too close to its star to be habitable, with temperatures soaring to many hundreds of degrees Celsius. If we want to find a planet with life on, a better bet will be to look in the so-called habitable zone, or Goldilocks zone, where it's not too hot and it's not too cold for liquid water to exist on the planet. And it wasn't long until the first of these planets was found. Meet Gliese 581c, a super-Earth found in 2007, residing 20 light-years away, with a mass around six times that of the Earth. Now, don't expect dinosaurs on the planet, it's still a pretty harsh place, but it is possible that some kind of extreme microbes might be able to exist on its surface. The search was off to a promising start, but in 2009 it escalated to a whole new level with the launch of the Kepler Space Telescope. For four years, Kepler stared at a single patch of sky, looking for the tiny dip in light as a planet passes in front of its star. And this is absolutely minuscule. Imagine staring at the beams of a car's headlight, and then looking for the tiny dip in light as a fly moves in front of it, and then waiting an entire year for that same fly to pass again. The great thing about this remarkable space telescope and this technique is that it's much more sensitive and capable of detecting much smaller planets, bringing us closer to the dream of an Earth-sized planet. So what has Kepler found? In 2011, Kepler announced the discovery of Kepler 22b, the first transiting super-Earth in the habitable zone. At 600 light years away, and only two and a half times bigger than the Earth, it was just the first of many promising habitable planets, and the results have been pouring in since then. In 2014, Kepler found a planet which was the first Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone of its star, Kepler 186f. And in fact, just this month, in January 2015, quite possibly the most Earth-like exoplanet ever was announced, Kepler 438b. Now what's really exciting about these discoveries is that Kepler was just staring at a small, tiny, random patch of the sky, and many of the habitable planets it found were around red dwarf stars, which are the most common type of star in the universe. 
So, statistically speaking, what we've learned is that one in five Sun-like stars have Earth-sized planets in their habitable zones, which means that, at least statistically, the nearest one to us should only be 12 light years away. 12 light years to the nearest habitable planet! That's incredible! And if we include red dwarfs, there may be as many as 40 billion of these planets just in our galaxy. But we have to be a little careful here, because just because a planet is in the habitable zone doesn't necessarily mean it will have liquid water on its surface, and that's because of its atmosphere. We only need to look at Venus within our own solar system with a runaway greenhouse effect going on and surface temperatures of 460 degrees Celsius to see that just because it's in the habitable zone doesn't necessarily mean it will be habitable. So if we want to know whether one of these planets really does have life on it, we're going to have to look at what its atmosphere is made of. And the way we do that is that when light passes through the atmosphere of a planet, we see tiny dips at certain specific wavelengths, kind of like a chemical barcode caused by the molecules that are present in the atmosphere. Two of the best targets to look for would be oxygen and methane, because they're both unstable for long periods of time, so if we see both of them in the atmosphere of the same planet, that's highly indicative that there could be life on that planet. But there's one problem here, which is that the Kepler planets, around 500 light years away, are just too far away for us to do this method. What we need to do is find the nearest potentially habitable planets. Luckily, that's exactly what we're planning to do over the next decade. In 2017, NASA is going to launch the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS, the successor to Kepler. TESS will do just what Kepler did, but for the nearest and brightest stars in the sky, potentially finding up to 10,000 Earth-sized worlds. And once we've found these planets, the successor to Hubble, the James Webb Space Telescope, launching in 2018, and the European Extremely Large Telescope in Chile, which should be finished around 2024, will be able to directly look and analyse the atmospheres of these planets, telling us what molecules are present, and finally giving us the answer of whether there is life on them. Because just imagine the day, perhaps only 10 years from now, when you can look up at the sky, point at an individual star, and say around that star is a planet, and on that planet is life. Because on that day, for the first time in human history, we will know that the universe is teeming with life. Thanks for watching! Would you like to see more on exoplanets in the future? And what do you think that the life on them might be like? Let me know in the comments below! If you want to learn more about how exoplanets are detected, Minute Physics has produced a great little summary which is a featured video over there on the right, or perhaps you'd like to look for planets yourself in the Kepler data at planethunters.org, more of which you can find out in the other featured video. Next time, on January 18th, I'm going to be making a big announcement on this channel about a brand new series of weekly videos. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss it, and until then, I'll see you next time.